Welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of one of the largest and oldest wrestling families on the planet. The Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. Through 93 years and four generations. The Stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name. You will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Please welcome the creator of the popular 605 podcast and the president of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, your co-host, the great Ryan Last. Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I'm the great Brian Last. It's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee Stud's going to tell us his stories of wrestling wars inside the ring and out, especially this week. Here on the Studcast, and without any further ado, the man of the hour, the Tennessee stud himself, Ron Fuller. Ron, I kind of teased it there at the top, and you teased it at the end of last week's show. Wrestling wars inside the ring and out. We're going to talk about maybe the biggest wrestling war up until the Monday Night War explosion in the late 90s. The biggest wrestling war wrestling had ever seen. Yes, uh, in my opinion, I think it definitely is, and uh, it's a great subject matter, uh, you know, we, I'd been thinking about trying to go on and get into Australia and, uh, you know, but this is something that takes place in the chronology of which my stud cast are falling. And it's such a monumental event that I, I want to tackle it before we start crossing the Pacific to go wrestle in another part of the world. I want to take care of the Atlanta wrestling war. And there's a tremendous story here, Brian, uh, much better than I even realized. Uh, I, and I am a part of this. I'm, I am a part of this toward the end of it, but this is a, it's turned out to be when, when I started looking at it and thinking about it, this is a two episode one, maybe even more, potentially even maybe more. And, uh, uh, this, I think fans will just be, uh, enthralled with, I mean, uh, they're going to hear a different opinion of things in this one that's ever been presented. And, uh, I look forward to jumping right into it, man. First, I want to thank everybody, uh, and especially the people that are just going crazy over the wrestling riot. Super Studcast number nine is just really, really exciting fans. A lot of people say they've never heard anything like it, and that's probably true. And I just really appreciate uh, their interest in that one and all our patrons jumping on board for that one. And and uh, naturally, for all our fans that are that are weekly fans and into our stud cast. And uh, I'm just ready to go, man. I got my horse saddled up and, uh, and he's ready to do some real running today because this one I think is going to set the fans around the world on fire. It'll give them something to talk about. I guarantee you that. I think everyone's intrigued by the topic. And I just want to say a little uh, behind the scenes talk here. Obviously, there's a lot that's been said throughout the years about the Georgia wrestling war. There's a lot of things that people just accept as being fact. Ron, you mentioned that you were a part of it for a period of time. You actually reached out to several other people who were involved with it. You read everything you can get your hands on. The information that you didn't have, you did your very best to fill in the blanks. So this isn't just you running off memory. This is you, the historian, actually trying to dive in and make sure the story is told correctly. That's exactly right. You know, I kind of have become, I'm kind of getting a reputation here as a wrestling historian and and uh, and and you've been a great benefit to me, Brian. I mean, you you are really you are a wrestling historian, and uh, lots of times there's things I don't know, and I just jump on your back and say, Brian, do you give me the answer to this? Uh, but I've gotten to where now I don't just put together studcast anymore. I, I I research them. I do the homework, and this one is one that's just phenomenal. Uh, and and everybody. There's a great deal of, of of people that think that that the people that are responsible for this 
may turn out not to be responsible for this. And uh, and this whole thing for 40 plus years has set out there and wrestling historians worldwide have taken a look at it, have looked at it. And uh, I think they've come up with the wrong concept of what actually went down. And I spoke to people that were there and involved in it. And uh, so I think I have a pretty decent perspective of what it's all about. And uh, I'm ready whenever you are, my man, to roll with it. Well, let's get rolling with it, Ron. We're going to start, I guess, the whole story for the wrestling war begins in 1972. But if you really want to look at it, you kind of have to go back a little bit. So you really understand the dynamics at play. Yeah, I really want to go back to 1964 to when my father buys into the Atlanta Territory uh, in 1964. We come out of uh, Mobile, Alabama. But before we get into it, I just want to make a couple. I got a couple little statements I want to make here, and uh, then we're going to tear into this subject. Uh, uh, this war, this the Atlanta Wrestling War, it, it basically is from it begins in 72 and it's basically just about over in 74. It's considered one of the most analyzed, dissected and history changing events in pro wrestling uh, from territory ownership to the role taken by the NWA in the war. This event has occupied the minds and thoughts of countless wrestling historians around the world for more than 40 years. Uh, and, you know, uh, with wrestling, it's it's it, it's very strange how wrestling, how it affects people and, and what what is and what isn't, you know. And uh, sometimes what happens behind the scene and not in the ring surpasses anything you will ever see in that ring. And the Atlanta wrestling war is exactly that. It is a monumental story in itself. So much going on behind the scenes that the fans don't know about. And I've had the opportunity to talk to guys that were a part of it in there involved in it. And, uh, I think I got a pretty good grasp of what happened in, uh, in the early seventies to turn wrestling upside down, all built around one city. So because of the complexity of this event and the, and the time constraints, we're basically talking about an hour here. I want to try to focus on, on just the members of my family that are perceived guilty of instigating starting this war. Uh, and uh, that would be part, obviously Lester Welch, who owns the part of the stock at this point. Uh, his son, Roy Lee, is there. I've talked a lot with Roy Lee. Uh, he's in that office. He sees a lot of what's going on during this time frame. And uh, and for probably the first time ever, I'm going to provide in this studcast previously unknown facts. I don't think it's I, I know some of them have never been presented because I learned for myself in the discussion with my brother and with Roy things that I did not know. So I'm going to provide some previously unknown facts here that are going to point to the possibility that the majority of wrestling historians on this subject were not correct about who and why this war started. And, uh, and I'm really honored to use my stud cast as this platform uh, to make a case that could potentially change the recorded history of the Atlanta wrestling wars for 45 years ago. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just burning with, uh, with, uh, the, the concept and the ideas and the study that I put into it. And, uh, so, uh, let's just start out this way. Um, uh, uh, first, uh, I'd like to briefly explain why why I think my family was not given the credit. They've never been given the credit for much of what they accomplished, and sometimes they've received blame for things they did not do. And I, I, I want to tell fans why. Is, and my dad always put it in a very great way. Uh, my dad, and he probably heard this from his father, uh, and I asked him, I said, you know, what is the mistakes? When I started my first wrestling promotion in Knoxville, Southeastern wrestling, I asked my dad, what can, what's one of the worst mistakes I can make? And he told me, and I'd heard him say this before. He said, never shine too bright a light. And, you know, it didn't make any sense to me when I first heard it. And I remember asking him, I said, well, what is, what does that mean? Uh, you know, when you go back to the early days, and and cafe is is it's what it's all about in the business, and uh, uh, you really 
keeping your mouth shut was just kind of what was expected of you. Uh, I come from one of the oldest wrestling families. I come from the oldest wrestling family that's still on the planet and been operating and in the sport for a hundred years now, practically a hundred years now. And we've always kept our mouths shut. Uh, we've never shined that bright light on ourselves. Uh, we never talked to people about the insides and what goes on. So then people make their own uh, own, uh, own ideas, uh, get their own ideas about what's actually going on with the Welch family and what's not going on with the Welch family. And a lot of times it's just not true. Uh, and another good reason for this saying about never shining too bright a light is what he really was trying to tell me is as a promoter of a company, an owner of a wrestling company, that you don't want to shine a bright light because when you do, there's a lot of people that want to be where you are and they want to take what you've built. And that's exactly what this story is all about. There are people that want to get in on the bottom and get themselves involved in the business and at any they'll take any means in any way to do it and uh so this story's got a great deal of both it's it's got a kayfabe aspect to it and then it's got at the same time it's got that that uh concept of uh of having a wrestling company and having a battle to see who is going to to continue to operate that company and that's what happens in atlanta this is a tremendous territory. It's been doing very well. And now it's got partners that are beginning to have problems. So in order, I think, Brian, to really break this down, I want to start out, I want to break the Atlanta wrestling war down into the pieces of the fascinating giant puzzle that it became. And it is truly a fascinating, just a huge puzzle of who all's involved and what's going on and why does this happen and, and why is it this person gets blamed for it or that person gets blamed for it. So the, in order to do it, I'm going to start right there. Uh, I'm going to break it down into pieces. And uh, here are those pieces. We're going to talk about the wrestlers involved the people that are actually involved in this corporation. We're going to talk about the corporate wrestling partnership and how that partnership is intended to work. Uh, we're going to talk about Atlanta's television history and its unique changes that are coming in that particular market. Not in, other, in any other market in America or the world is television about to change things except for in right there in Atlanta. We'll talk about the transfer of stock from my father to his uncle, Lester Welch, uh, and the attack and the very antagonistic relationship that develops between Lester and Ray Gunkel. And then ultimately, we're going to talk about the attempt of one partner to take control of the company from another. And that's pretty basic as to what the Atlanta Wars are all about. Uh, and uh, I think uh, doing it that way, people, I'll be able to at least let people know who the players are and, uh, and what the field looks like. And it's going to be kind of like a football game. And we're going to see who wins and why and maybe how this is all developed. Well, you mentioned the players. Who were the players involved in this puzzle, as it were? Okay, we'll start with the gentleman that my dad bought his his uh, stock from in uh, 1964 when we came to Atlanta, Georgia. His name was Don McIntyre. Don McIntyre came to Georgia in the 1940s as a wrestler, and he ends up owning 45% of the company. He becomes a very successful man in real estate. Uh, that's due to Atlanta's huge population growth in the early 60s. And his wrestling company is doing very well. Uh, it's having great success. Uh, he gets ready to, uh, you know, and you wonder when you buy stock from somebody in a company, especially a wrestling company, why you want to sell it, okay? So Don's doing well, but he's got this real estate uh, company that he owns, and he's he's just selling property here and there and everywhere in Atlanta. He's doing making a lot of money with that, and he doesn't need the wrestling. And he finds out, he's going to find out, my dad is going to find out from conversations with Don, who's been there and involved for many years and been a partner with Ray Gunkel for many years, that Ray is difficult to get along with. Don has done so well, though, before I go on to that, he has done so well that he 
he, he's, he becomes real close and tight with my dad, and he invites us to go out on his yacht. I call it a yacht because it's, uh, it's the biggest boat on Lake Lanier. Now, Lake Lanier, for people that don't know, in the Atlanta area is the premier lake. Uh, people with money and people that don't have money. They all fish there and they boat there. It's a beautiful, fabulous lake. It's got several different marinas. And Don McIntyre has a 65-foot yacht on Lake Lanier. Uh, we go out and spend two days on it. You sleep on it. It's it's a monster. It's got four or five bedrooms. It's a, it's just a fantastic boat. And what it does for me as a young guy is I realize how much money you can make in wrestling and uh, and what you can have. It kind of uh, it puts me. I'm a sophomore in high school. It kind of puts me on a path to saying, "Gosh, I I want to be successful like this. I want to I want to have me a boat like this. I want to I want to accomplish the things that, that Don McIntyre has accomplished, as an example." Uh, so, uh, one of those trips out there, I overhear Dad and and Don McIntyre having a discussion about Ray, and 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 Don. I didn't pick up all of it. I wasn't supposed to be part of it. I just happened to hear it walking through a room and Don's saying that, that, uh, Ray is the, he's a, uh, he's a kind of, a uh, and he, he's, he's hard to deal with. He's, he's fairly much a, he, he, that Ray's had that, that, uh, Don has had a whole bunch of run-ins with Ray, uh, in his time as partners with him and that he's a difficult man to deal with. And, uh, and I'm thinking as I walk through there, well, my dad's a pretty reasonable guy, and I feel like he'll be able to work with most anybody. But I'm about to learn differently as time goes by here. Uh, so we've talked about McIntyre briefly. McIntyre sells out to dad in 64, and he disappears from the Atlanta wrestling scene. Uh, my father uh, comes in. He buys that 45% that Don McIntyre owns. Uh, basically, Ray Gunkel has a 45%, uh, pretty much equal share to what back to what uh, McIntyre had. Now he is basically equal partners with my dad. And uh, my dad, for people that don't know, obviously he got a, quite a bit of training by his father, Roy, my grandfather, and Roy's brother, Herb who was an older, about the same age as Roy and been around a long time. Charlie Carr, I've mentioned in, in Studcast before, who trained my dad, who trained me too. Uh, but there was another guy that I've never mentioned before. And this guy is a key figure in, in wrestling and in what's going to happen down the line in my story here about Atlanta. And his name is Ed Strangler Lewis. Uh, Lewis has a great influence on on my family, and it's because, well, first let's get into just to, for those people out there that don't know who Ed Strangler Lewis is. He was born in 1891. He died in 1966. His real name was Robert Herman Julius Frederick. Uh, he went by the alias, obviously, of Ed Strangler Lewis. Uh, uh, he was one of the great shooters of all time. Uh, he was four times world champion prior to the NWA's formation in 1948. The Back in the day before the NWA, there were areas of the country that claimed their own world champion. And he had a he was such a great shooter that if he wanted to be your champion, he'd just show up there and and uh, if you didn't put him on the card, he'd probably come into the ring and then he you had to give him the opportunity. And that he was a he was kind of a cutthroat gentleman that that went around the country and made a lot of money in the wrestling business early in the 1900s when there wasn't being a lot of money made in much of any sports in America at that point. Uh, he got this name of Strangler because he went and worked in France. Uh, he worked with somebody in France. I can't remember the name of that gentleman. But he actually used a sleeper hold. He had that's why he was called the strangler. He had developed a type of sleeper hold that looked like a choke hold. And uh, he beat the French champion, and the crowd was very, very upset. They thought that he had strangled him, that he he had strangled him into uh, unconsciousness. Well, actually, he put a sleeper hold on him. Uh, so after that, they started calling him the strangler. So 
Now, Ed, 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 Ed Lewis, Ed Strangler Lewis, he is a pivotal character with a trio that was called the Goldust Trio in the early 1900s. Uh, three great wrestling talents, shooters, all of them. Uh, Ed Strangler Lewis, Toots Mont, and Big Billy Sandow. And those three guys traveled around the country in the early 1900s. Uh, they're given credit for changing the sport. They, they were the first ones to have these undercards. It was usually just two guys wrestling each other, and you paid all the money to see one match. Sometimes that match would last three hours. Uh, they started having undercards. They also started doing storylines and actually working feuds in which they would come back to towns and have a rematch. So they're already making these little small changes to wrestling as it has been uh, from 1900 up to around 1920. Uh, on September 20th, 1934, um, uh, actually in, uh, in December of 1920, uh, Strangler Lewis is going to win his first world championship. Uh, on September 20th, 1934, he's going to wrestle Jim Londis and Wrigley Field in Chicago before 35,000 fans. Uh, it's a record crowd and a record gate of $96,302 that's going to stand until 1952. When I saw this fact, I was like, wow, that is a phenomenal amount of money for back in that time frame. And you got to expect that this is 1934. For you're right in the heart of the depression. How in the world does wrestling draw that kind of crowd and get that type of money through a current turnstile in uh, 1934? So, uh, so he goes he goes around the country now, uh, and he will wrestle different part areas of the country. He goes to Ohio, where my grandfather Roy happens to go in 1920, early 1920s, and stays there for about seven years in Ohio. And Ed Strangler Lewis comes into that territory. They have their own world champion there. There's a little territory in Columbus, Ohio, and a small territory in Toledo, Ohio. They mix and match uh, talent. They trade guys back and forth. They got a pretty good little operation going on in that part of the country. Strangler Lewis comes in there. He wins their championship. At the same time, he becomes real close friends with Roy. Uh, Roy really creates a great relationship with him in a very short period of time. So in 1947, about the time that Lester Welch, my, my granddad, Roy's youngest brother, he's not but two years older than my dad. So he's almost in the same generation as my dad and 20 years younger, basically, than Roy. And uh, dad and Lester are starting to train in the late 60s, after, in the late 40s after the war. And... Uh, Roy talks Ed Strangler Lewis coming in and spending four months training both my dad and Lester. Uh, now, that fact is going to become knowledgeable to some wrestlers around the country. And it's going to it's going to have a it's going to bring a lot of respect to those two wrestlers, my dad and Lester, because of their training with Ed Strangler Lewis. Uh, later on in this stud cast. Uh, actually, if we can get to it today, this is going to be a long stud cast. There's a lot of information that I'm going to impart today. Uh, there will be a, with, people will understand the significance of this training that Ed Strangler Lewis gave to my dad and Lester because it's going to come into play in this whole story. Uh, now we know about dad. Obviously, we know about Don McIntyre. Let's learn a little bit about Lester Welch. Uh, Lester's about six foot two. He's a little over six foot, actually. He's probably not six, but maybe six one. He weighs about 220 pounds. Uh, we talked a lot about Lester in the last stud cast, number 61, in which he's flying us into San Juan. And, and he's at this point not wrestling much anymore, but he's still a tough son of a gun, very much of admire, admired and respected by wrestlers. Uh, he's a quiet guy that I've already talked about, and he's kind of a humble dude. You know, you never know what he's done and what he's accomplished in his life. Uh, he was actually a true cowboy. He actually roped, uh, roped calves and dog steers and rode bulls. And I mean, uh, he did it all in, in actual as an actual cowboy before he ever started doing any wrestling. Uh, 
And he's only there are only two years difference in the age between he and my my father. So obviously they're like brothers to each other, and they work tag team partners hundreds of times all across the United States, uh, back in the fifties, late forties, early fifties, on into the sixties. Uh, Lester is a part owner at this time frame of uh, the Florida Territory. He has a small piece. Uh, I don't know the exact percentage. But the Florida Territory is a nice company to have a part of. And he's a great partner because he kind of keeps his mouth shut and he rides along. He's easy to get along with. Uh, so uh, and, and I want to, you know, I use a photo each each episode uh, of, of a person that's uh, that's a kind of the premier person in this in this stud cast and I'm going to use a picture of Lester Welch and, and his picture when fans take a look at it it'll be on the stud on the Tennessee stud site uh, under the stud cast uh, and it'll also be on the gallery there and it's a picture of Lester after winning the Cadillac in Jacksonville Florida in a Cadillac tournament in the late 1960s. Uh, he's been hard weighed over both eyes by Sputnik Monroe during the course of the match and he's such a he's such a tough son of a gun that uh, after he Monroe has busted both his eyes, Monroe gets him gets somehow he gets hold of his ankle of Lester's ankle and he's twisting his ankle, and Lester screams to him to break it. He's telling him break my ankle because he knows he's already going to the hospital. He's got stitches to get put in his face and he wants to go there with multiple injuries he, he's he's that type of guy he's so committed to his sport and he's so tough in his in his in his mind that he's he's got two busted eyes and now he wants you to break his ankle uh monroe couldn't couldn't break his ankle or wouldn't break his ankle and i asked him one time about that match and he said he said ron he goes I realized Lester Welch at that point was the toughest son of a bitch I'd ever been in the ring with. He said, I, I became horrified of him. He was so, he was so, so tough beyond what, what measure that most people could go to. So that's a little bit about Lester. You got Ray Gunkel, uh, who's six, three, about 250 pounds, played football and wrestled at, at Purdue university. Uh, very well respected athlete. Uh, he turned pro in 1940s uh, and he became a huge star in Atlanta. Came there in the early 50s, became a big enough star that he worked his way into buying uh, who's ever stock that, uh, that he purchased his stock from uh, in, in, in the late 50s. Uh, and so, you know, but Ray's a he's a he's a big guy. Uh, he's got more size than say Lester and my dad is an example. He's he's taller. He's got more weight. He's got that pro football background. Uh, he has an amateur background, but he does not have that shooter's background and that pro background in which you know that changes you from being just a great wrestler on the mat to being somebody that can hurt you, and. Uh, and that makes a big difference in wrestling, uh, especially back in these days in the 40s, 50s, and the 60s. So he's a bit outspoken. He, he's a confrontational, uh, and he's accustomed to doing things his way. Uh, he's he's a bit of a bully in a way, you know. But he's a good guy, and I, and I I, I liked him. Uh, I kind of grew up with him as a young guy from being a sophomore in high school on. Uh, he becomes part of, like I said, part owner of the territory. He marries a lady named Ann, and Ann Gunko was, she's a she's a model in Atlanta. She's a beautiful, beautiful lady, and uh, and a good person. I really liked Ann. I, I really had a lot of respect for Ann, uh, and she's widely recognized in in Atlanta as a prominent figure. I mean, she comes from a good family. Uh, she's a, it's a great catch for Ray. To, to have married her, and, and she's going to be a big part of his life uh, until, he, until he dies. Much younger than Ray also, correct? Much younger. Maybe a generation younger uh, than Ray. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's a great catch for Ray, and, and she's smart, and uh, uh, she's hard worker. Uh, 
uh, and and she's got a great personality. She's beautiful. I mean, it's it's everything I suppose that's kind of what you what you want in a wife, you know. Uh, the only figure left in this in this to really put a shine a light on here is uh, Paul Jones. Uh, Paul Jones is a obviously we've talked about Paul Jones in, in prior prior episodes too. Back when we were talking about that uh, tremendous show in 1965 that drew 30,000 plus people in Atlanta, and uh, Paul is a Kim there is a wrestler. Um, he's six four. Paul's tall and he's about 260 pounds and and he's comes from my granddad's time frame. So I mean he's a, one of those older guys that's just huge. My granddad was only 5'8". Uh, Paul Jones is 6'4". My granddad is about 220. Paul's about 260. I mean, he is a massive, huge guy. He's a tremendous shooter. He has the shooter capabilities, too. Uh, he's a great hook scissor guy. And uh, he he spends time with me and shows me how to do the hook scissor because I got the long legs like he had. And I really just loved him. He was a great old fella, and uh, so did other people loved him. Uh, and uh, he got involved in the territory and got a piece of it way back in the 40s. And he is a his stock is a, is around the 10 percent uh, range because dad has 45. Ray's got 45. Uh, Paul's got that last 10 percent. And Paul is recognized as the promoter and the figurehead for the corporation. And there's a reason for that is because uh the partners, the actual partners, my dad and Ray, are actually wrestling at that time frame. So you don't want to be recognized as an owner of the company and a wrestler for the company at the same time. So they put Paul in that figurehead and promoter uh, of the corporation uh, atmosphere where fans really believe that he is the guy that runs the show. He doesn't really have a lot to do with what's going on and what's going to happen there. But he is the perfect guy to front for the company. He's well respected. He and he's a straight shooter. And uh and he when it comes to honesty, I mean, this guy is one of those that just uh uh he he just he, you admire him. I I, mean, I love this guy. I, I you know I'm really torn here because I, I I thought Ray Gunkel was a great guy. He was a great guy. Uh, and I really loved Ann because she was such a down to earth good person. I, uh, uh, and uh, Lester obviously I grew up around him quite a bit and his boys Roy Lee and Jackie and uh, you know so I'm kind of torn between all of this stuff that I I've researching here about this war and. Uh, it's a pretty phenomenal scene that's about to develop here. Well, we're really just kicking things off right here on the Studcast, and we will return to Atlanta in a moment. But first, a word about Super Studcast number nine, Wrestling Riots. Bone chilling Super Studcast number nine, Wrestling Riots, is rocking the wrestling world at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Ron slices through the subject like the sharp knives that penetrated both he and his father years ago. They are the only father and son in wrestling history to be cut by fans, adding another first to the Welsh family legacy. This three hour jaw dropping Super Studcast takes you into that dangerous place where Fans and wrestlers collide in a battle for life. It describes no less than 20 riots, 14 of which the stud personally witnessed or was involved in. It's an unforgettable adrenaline rush. Definitely not for the faint of heart. At tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Only $2.99. If you've never saddled up for a super studcast, this one is for you. There you hear it, Super Studcast number nine, Wrestling Riots, available right now at tnstud.com and patreon.com slash studcast only, two ninety nine. So check that out. It is a tremendous show. We'll have more information about that at the end of today's program. But let's return to Atlanta. Ron, you have told us all the players. You said that you were going to lay out the way the corporate partnership works. How does it work? Okay. Uh, I think a good way for me to explain this is to use one of my companies as an example. Uh, my first company, Southeastern Wrestling in Knoxville, I was the only owner. I didn't have to 
ask anybody what to do or, or to make decisions for me, or I was totally in charge. Uh, when I started my second company in Pensacola, I went down and made the deal with the Fields Brothers to buy that Gulf Coast territory from them. And then I had people in mind that I wanted to give a piece of the company to, not give it to, but let them purchase it, let them have the opportunity to own stock in a company. Uh, obviously, some of them are family members, my brother Robert, uh, Jimmy Golden, my cousin, and another cousin, Roy Lee Welch. Uh, so there's four of us, four Welches involved, and then I really wanted to give Bob Armstrong, who I thought was one of the great guys and one of the great workers uh, that's ever been in wrestling, uh, an opportunity to be more than just a wrestler. So what I did is I kept uh, I went down and, and paid for things, and these guys didn't have, have a lot of money at this point. And uh, so I paid for everything. I bought the company, basically, and I kept 55%, and I told them I would sell them 45%. And so the, between the four of them, they all owned pieces of somewhere between 5 and 25%. Uh, now, those, percent those percentages over a period of eight years that this corporation was in, was there, uh, they changed hands periodically. And uh, uh, I always maintained my controlling interest. I never sold any of my stock, but sometimes one of these four guys would sell a little stock to the other one, and uh, I didn't care. It didn't make any difference to me. I was happy that they had a piece of it, and they were darn happy to have a piece of it. Uh, I always had the final say, and uh, they wanted it that way because I had had the experience of running the Knoxville Territory by myself for many, many years. So uh, we met once a month. This is kind of way a lot of corporation wrestling corporations worked. Uh, if you had partners, you meet once a month. You discuss business. How are we doing? Uh, do we want to take changes? Uh, we need a new booker. Whatever you want to discuss, and you usually split dividends at that point. Uh, we had a few disagreements, uh, the five of us, but they were very, very few. And, uh, and if there had ever been any big problems, there could have and should have been an exchange of stock to solve those or, or, or the stockholders, one stockholder could sell all of his stock to somebody and leave the corporation so that the business would continue normally. Now, that's the difference. That's one of the main differences between the corporation that dad buys into in 1964. And that, and, and that corporation, uh, it's called ABC Booking, is the name of the corporation in Atlanta Territory in 1964. Uh, dad bought in, like I said, 45%. Uh, Ray owns 45 and Paul Jones owns 10 uh, There is no controlling interest here for one partner. That's not a good situation. That's why I wanted to maintain better than 50% uh, of the corporation in Pensacola so that if there was ever a big problem, then I would have the last say. And uh, I felt like I had the head and, uh, and the experience to make the right decision for maybe whoever we would be having a problem. But this situation doesn't exist in the ABC Booking Corporation because there's equal, my dad, Ray, equal partners, uh, own less than 50%. Paul Jones is the key man here because he owns the other 10%. And so from 54 to late 60s, uh, Ray and dad, they do very well. They're, we're, they're very close. Uh, in fact, they wrestle as tag partners all through, uh, through 65, 66, 67. Uh, they, are, they are the tag team champions in Georgia a lot of that time period. Uh, between uh, They lose it occasionally, but they manage to win it back. And they're, they're big time over in Georgia at this point. Uh, and my family is spending a lot of time with Ray's family and with Ann, and they've got a young son. And we're going out on Lake Lanier with them. Uh, Ray and Ann take us on their ski boat, and they teach Rob and I to ski. And Ray's got a fantastic home in uh, Marietta up in the northern part of Atlanta, and he's got a tennis court. He's got the swimming pool. He's got it all there. And uh, and we're invited on practically every weekend. So everything is going great in that corporation. Everybody's happy. Business is fantastic. And uh, 
Then I leave for college in 1967, and, and I don't know what happens because I'm very rarely home until I come back in 1970 to start wrestling after finishing University of Miami. Uh, but things change between Ray and my dad, and uh, I, I don't know why, but it certainly happened. Uh, so let's discuss uh, that that kind of gives you an idea of the corporation, how it's set up, and, and all of the potential problems that can happen with this type of setup. Uh, let's talk about the next thing. Atlanta's changing TV stations. Wow. Atlanta, it's, it's, this, is a, this topic alone is a fabulous topic to me. Uh, we arrive in Atlanta in 1964. The TV wrestling uh, program is called Live Atlanta Wrestling. It's on Channel 11, ABC affiliate. It has been there uh, since 1954. There's a great commentator uh that's been there with that program i assume he was there in 54 i don't have that history that far back but his name was ed capel and he did a phenomenal job he was the gordon soley before there was a gordon soley really really good at his job uh there's a young guy that that's a businessman in atlanta during this time frame 64 65 66 uh and his name's Ted Turner. He's a, and he's a huge wrestling fan. He's a big enough wrestling fan that he liked to come to the television studios on Saturdays in Atlanta uh, to just come back in the back and be around the guys. Uh, and that's very unusual back in those days. Uh, you didn't have guys in your dressing room that you didn't know. But Ted Turner had a had a lot of charisma about him, and I, I, he was going places. Uh, and even as a young guy and a young businessman in this time frame, the early 60s, uh, he's, he begins showing up regularly at the TV station. And he, like I say, he's accepted by all the guys. Uh, he w tells my dad, he becomes a friend with my dad, and he says, I want to own my own TV station. Uh, and and he's he's determined uh, that he's a, he's one of those guys, those businessmen that's going to go places. He's just driven to do something spectacular, and he he wants to change the landscape of television, uh, and and not just in Atlanta. He wants to change the worldwide concept of how we watch TV and how our television stations send a signal to us, and all of these thoughts. So. He finally is going to buy Atlanta's first UHF station in January 1970, and he's going to change the call letters to w WTCG. He and Dad were very, very close. Uh, he's and and I spent a lot of time uh, in in Studcast number 29. If people want to look back, uh, you'll find a picture of, of of Ted Turner there. You know, I mean, uh, he's that important a figure, in my opinion, in Atlanta wrestling. Uh, maybe as important, maybe most important figure ever in the history of Atlanta wrestling. Maybe he's not a wrestler. It could have been Ted because of what he accomplishes. Uh, and I remember we talked extensively about him and his friendship with Dad at that point. This is as far back as Studcast number 29. So he recognizes the fact that cable TV is coming, and eventually satellite broadcasting is a possibility for the future of television. He is way, way ahead of his time. I remember talking on the program about how Dad spent one morning talking to me about it when I was a senior in high school, asked me what I knew about cable TV and a satellite. You know, I knew nothing like anybody else at that point. But this fast-growing relationship between him and Dad, uh, it's about to change things for the, for Atlanta wrestling there. Uh, and it, that change gets started in August of 1971 because the show is going to change its name from being – Live Atlanta wrestling to Georgia championship wrestling. Uh, so things are happening there already. And, uh, and it's going to come a time not long afterward that it's going to move to Ted's WTCG at six o'clock on Saturday afternoons. And that's going to change the sport forever in Atlanta and not just Atlanta and a lot of other places in the world. So, I've kind of covered a little bit of that thing there. What I want to do now, Brian, is I'd like to change. I want to create a timeline for me to be able to explain to fans how this all is work is working. Uh, I want to go back and just and just put the pieces together. And this is how I see it. 
I'm not going to say how this is how all wrestling historians see it, but I believe I've got a great perspective because I don't know any of these wrestling historians whose families were involved in this, whose friendships were involved in this. I was highly involved in Atlanta uh, long before the war started, and I always, I always really, really thought Atlanta wrestling and what happened there is really phenomenal. So let's start in 1964. Let's drop back again to when we go to Atlanta, my dad and my brother and mom and I, uh, and he and dad gets equal partners, buys in equal partners with Ray. And things go well, as I've mentioned, uh, for a long time. They get along great. And uh, then I think what really starts to click the, 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 the problem between my dad and Ray is his dad starts pushing for this move to Turner's television station. Once Ted gets hold of the UHF station, uh, and Dad and, and Ted have spent countless hours together, and Ted's explained to him how cable is going to work and how the satellite can send a signal worldwide and that wrestling from Atlanta can be seen in Australia, uh, can be seen anywhere in the world. And Dad starts to get this picture and he sees his, he sees that you know channel 11's been a great station they've done great business there but this gives that Atlanta territory opportunity to become the monster uh, uh, of wrestling if they wanted to you know so he's trying to explain this to Ray and Ray just doesn't grasp it you know, he just doesn't understand uh, the significance of what Turner is trying to develop. Uh, there, so there's a big disagreement. Ray says, you know, hey, why do we need to do it? We're already doing good business. And, uh, you know, uh, our station is just fine that we're on. And Dad, uh, Dad just uh, keeps harping on the fact that this is where our company needs to be. So this causes a major problem between the two major stockholders here. Uh, and at the same time, Ted Turner's no, he's a sharp guy. He's very aware that wrestling will do for his little fledgling UHF station uh, what nothing else will do for him. It will turn him great numbers. It will get him where he wants to be as he works toward this cable television and satellite hookup. Uh, when he puts it on air uh, via satellite on December 17th of 1976, uh, the station instantly went from being a small independent television station in one market to a major coast-to-coast -coast operation. It also signaled the start of the basic cable revolution in America, basic cable TV revolution. Uh, all of that's Ted Turner. All of that's WTCG in Atlanta. It's going to become TBS. Uh, Dad's right. I mean, there, there's no looking back on this picture in any form or fashion and saying he should have stayed at Channel 11. He damn sure is way ahead of his time, too, and saying, uh, D Ray, we need to go to Turner's channel. We need to get involved in this because it's going to be a monster. So early 71, uh, Dad's, with Dad's support of Paul Jones, Dad pushing in, he's talking to Paul, uh, he's talking to Ray, he's trying to get him to, to, to think that this is, to see what the potential is here. And he finally gets R Paul's vote. They put it up to a vote. Paul goes with Dad, and he decides that, yes, I think we need to make the move and go to Turner's station. Well, Ray is obviously furious about it. He's, he's, he's very upset about it. And uh, so... Dad, dad feels bad, uh, and dad offers to sell his stock to him. He goes to him, and he told me, he said, I, I went to him, I went to Ray and offered him to see if he wanted to buy my stock because, you know, he's not real happy with this new TV situation. And, and uh, so they couldn't, they, they couldn't agree on what, a value, what the value was. So dad retains his stock. And, uh, and then not too long afterward, something happens between the two of them. That, And this is not the type of thing that normally happens in wrestling either, but this did happen. And uh, uh, Dad, he mysteriously looks at the card one week, and he's, he's booked against uh, Paul Butcher Vachon. Uh, and, uh, and, and Butcher's out of Montreal and very close friends with Ray Gunkel, been friends with Ray for many, many years. Uh, he's, uh, 
Paul Butcher Vachon is considered to be somewhat a shooter and uh, he's got some wrestling background and, you know, and dad can't figure out what's the reason for putting a match like that on the card. So, so we, he goes to the town on that Friday night in Atlanta and he, he tells me this story. He says that, that he goes in the dressing room, like always, normally the booker, uh, and the booker at this point is still Tom Ernesto. Uh, Tom Ernesto goes in, the booker will go and he will sit with two guys and they will discuss the match. Uh, but, uh, Ernesto doesn't come and he gets, it's uh, probably, uh, he's like the fourth match and the second match is in the ring. And he's, so he goes to the dressing room where, where Vashon is and, uh, Ray's in his, in, in his dressing room. Dad doesn't think anything about it. And he says, Oh guys, how y'all doing? A little cordial conversation. And then, uh, dad says, uh, well, okay, what are we, what are we doing? And uh, Ray says, uh, well, why don't you come back later? So Dad says, he doesn't think anything about it. So he goes on back to his dressing room, and he stays there. He goes out, watches another match. The match goes by. He goes a second time. He goes to the dressing room again. It's still, Ernesto doesn't go. Ernesto's not there. Uh, and it's still Ray in there with Vashon, and he asks again. He says, "Okay, uh, what are we what are we doing here tonight, guys?" And uh, and Ray says, uh, "Well, uh, we'll let you know in a little bit." Well, now they're one match away from being in the ring, so it's time now that some some has got to some's got to go here. So he goes and he stays out for a few minutes of that match. It's in the ring, and he goes back and. Uh, and he says uh, again, you know, well, what are we doing? And uh, and Vashon has not spoken. He hasn't said anything. And Ray looks at Dad and he says, uh, you need to get your best hold. And that's very meaningful to a wrestler. When you get told that, you understand pretty quickly that uh, we're not going to go out there and work tonight. We're, we're going to go out and shoot. And uh, so... So dad says, I said, what'd you do? And he said, I, le I left the dressing room. He said, I was already dressed to go in the ring. And uh, he said, uh, wasn't but a few more minutes and they rang the bell. And so, so I asked him, you know, what, what did you do? And, and uh, cause I never knew this. Uh, I'm not even the, there at that time. Uh, I'm in college. And uh, so he goes to the ring and he says that, uh, that Vashon is there and they and he looks they look at each other uh the referee calls them to the center of the ring and he's he's checking their things and so dad said I said what did he, what did you say and he said I told him he said I he said I looked at him and I said uh I own part of this company uh I I am this is my town uh this is my life he said, uh, he said, all these people, he said, I kind of just move my arm around, you know, like the pantomime. He said, all of these people came to see something tonight. And he says, uh, I think then it looks like to me, we're going to give them something that they've never seen. But basically, okay, the, the shoot's on, you know, I mean, uh, uh, this stuff don't happen very often in wrestling either. Uh, no. So, I, so I said, uh, you know, yeah, what did he say? And uh, he said, uh, he, he said he had his head down while I was talking to him, and he said, when I finished, he looked up at me, and he says, uh, he says, we're not going to shoot. He says, uh, you beat me any way you want. So, but Ray put him in that position. Uh, this was a buddy of his uh, who he had brought from Montreal, expecting, I guess, that he was going to go in there and try it with Dad. I think a lot of this, and this is going to go back to this earlier in the program, talking about Ed Strangler Lewis. It's going to go back to the reputation that a lot of the Welches had for being shooters and that relationship with Ed Strangler Lewis and the Charlie Carr training. And uh, I mean, you... So I believe that the Vashans, as tough as their reputation was, and they had a great reputation for being really tough guys, uh, realized that, you know, these guys down south here, they may know a hell of a lot of stuff that, that we don't know and that I don't know. And, and when you start thinking about a shoot and, uh, and, and, and the potential for yourself being hurt, 
I think it probably uh, chilled him a little bit, and it kind of probably changed his mind a little bit. That's a story I had never heard before, and I have to assume most people would probably be in the same boat. They had never heard that story before either. What does that say about the state of the relationship between your father and Ray at that point, that it would just get to the point where he would bring someone in and threaten a... I mean, I'm sure he, he didn't think that your father would be up for the challenge. He thought it was going to intimidate your father just having to go in there with a Vashon and shoot. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it killed their relationship. I mean, they, they didn't have much of a relationship at this point. I mean, Dad had offered to sell him his stock. Uh, Ray didn't want to pay the figure that the stock was probably worth. And uh, and then he he, he he stoops to this level to to try to get rid of him, you know, figuring maybe he'll just he'll he'll leave. Well, and that and that's basically where we are now. That's that's exactly about what's going to happen here. So very shortly after this incident goes down in, in early 71, uh, then uh, summer 71, Dad goes to Leicester. And Dad's been in Georgia now since 1964. That's a long time for Dad. Uh, having grown up around him and seeing him, him develop all these great territories, uh, once they get to selling out, he normally wants to leave. He wants to go someplace that's dead, and he wants to make it happen again. But he's not done that here. He's been there a long time. But now I, I think he's ready to go. I'm wrestling in Florida. Rob's in and out of Florida. Uh, Eddie's down there, who's a great friend of Dad's. And so Dad and Lester work an agreement between them in which they not only trade wrestling stock, they trade their farms, they trade their houses, they trade their horses, they trade everything they own. Lester makes a move to Georgia. Dad makes a move to Florida, and they they don't they just move their furniture out of their each other's houses, and they take over their other person's life. It's pretty strange, as to what how he handled it. You know, I mean, he so he basically now he throws Lester into Ray's face, and uh, it's a. Uh, so it's a real attitude adjustment that's going on right at this time frame. Uh, and uh, so they don't get along. <laughs> Basically, that's what happens from the very beginning. Uh, uh, I believe that what happens, in my opinion, the actual war, the Atlanta war begins right there. When dad trades that, trades his stock and his farms and his life for Lester's, and Lester becomes Ray's partner, and Dad goes south to a great situation in Florida that Ray goes off the wall. He just goes, wow, this is absolutely ridiculous. He he doesn't like Lester, uh, and he's, he's, he's got that attitude to where he wants to run the whole show. And I believe, in my opinion, the war for Atlanta begins right there when Dad says, I've traded everything to Lester. You've got a new partner. See if you can deal with him. And uh, I believe Ray starts planning on then trying to set something up. And I have reasons to say this, too. And I, I wouldn't just say this if I hadn't have done the research. So I talked to Roy Lee Welch, who is Lester's son, who goes with Lester to Atlanta when they trade the stock, and Roy works in the wrestling office. He sees the relationship and the bitterness between Ray and Lester on a daily basis. And he tells me, he says, once I remember that they had some business guys in the office and Ray and Lester were in the room. And he said, I don't know exactly what was, what went on in the room, but he said, Lester came out, his dad, he said, my dad came out. He was very, very upset. And he said, the businessman came out and left the room. And then Ray came out. And when Ray came out, Lester said, Ray, you need to come outside. I want to talk to you. And Roy then obviously heard that. He watches them go outside into the parking lot. And then Roy says, uh, he asks his dad later on what's hap what happens. But So they go out there, and Lester, being a quiet and, uh, you know, laid-back guy, he says, uh, basically, he says, you know, don't ever do that to me again, Ray. Don't ever insult me or, or, or embarrass me in front of business people. He goes, there's no reason for that. I know we don't get along. Uh, you know, Lester's trying to talk to him in a fairly nice way, but he's letting him know that 
this isn't going to work for me. You can't do that anymore. So after Lester makes his little statement, Ray says to him, he goes, well, he goes, you got a little reputation. You know, I, I hear you've been in a few fights and, uh, and you've won some of them, but, uh, you know, that doesn't scare me. That doesn't bother me. And, uh, Lester then says, he goes, no, uh, Ray, you're wrong. He goes, I have not been in a lot of fights. He says, I've been a few in a few fights and I've won them all. So, Basically, he's basically saying, okay, we're here out here in the parking lot. And, you know, if you want to find out, now's a good time to find out. Things are breaking up here. What's happening here is is this corporation, this partnership is becoming destroyed by, by you know, uh, uh, the, the, the people just not being able to get along. Uh, this 45% rather than owning a 55% is a huge difference. And it just, it just makes things more and more difficult. So now, you know, that story, you know, what he tried to do with dad. Now, you know, a conversation that he had with, with Lester. And I've got three things here that I've, I've, I, I look at that. I know happened for sure. Uh, Bob Armstrong tells me one of these. Bob Armstrong, I trust vehemently. He's only one that stays with Lester's company when all of this goes down. And uh, Ray does three strange things after this, this, this. I believe that the war is already going on, that Lester, I mean, that Ray is already setting things up to get his own program to maybe figure out how to get Lester totally out of the company. Uh, he's so three things happen in a, in this time frame in 72, uh, Ray suddenly decides after many years, he has not wrestled for many years. He's very much out of shape. He's gained a lot of weight. He suddenly decides to become, uh, friends with Turner. Now he doesn't like Turner. He, because, you know, Turner and dad moving the television to Turner station and Paul Jones going along with dad, uh, that created great problems. So he'd never liked Turner. And all of a sudden, uh, Roy says that, that, uh, Ray becomes best friends with Ted Turner. He starts spending a tremendous amount of time with Ted in spite of his feelings over this TV deal that he was so exposed to a year earlier. Now he's wanting to make Ted his best friend. Now, my theory is about this is, is if you were preparing to, to make an attempt to take over a territory uh, or to take over a company, you want to get with the guy that runs the television. He's a very critical figure. And if you've got that guy on your side, uh, then you're in a position to maybe he'll say, well, you know, I'll only keep this company if Ray's involved in it. Uh, otherwise, I might take you, Lester, off of TV. It kind of either ensures him that he's going to get his own TV slot or he's at least going to get a, a, another television slot that he may be able to compete with Lester if they end up having to go head to head. This is my theory, but you know, it's my show. <laughs> so, you know, and it's my family and, uh, and, and I've done the research and, uh, and I, I, I'm going to lay it out here today. I'm going to, I'm going to tell the people, tell all these fans out here what I really think uh, potentially happened here. And it's a lot different than what, is normally said about this topic. The second thing that Ray does in this same time frame is he starts back wrestling again. After he's been retired and off for a long time, he's very much out of shape. And he doesn't just wrestle in Atlanta. He starts wrestling in all of the towns. He wants to wrestle in Fred Ward's Macon in uh, Columbus. He's wrestling in Augusta. He's wrestling in Savannah. He's wrestling in Atlanta. He's out of shape. And there's... The, and uh, Bob Armstrong tells me this. He says, Ron, he started wrestling full time. He goes out of the career boo. He said, I couldn't figure out why in the world would he, he's got money. He's got no reason to want to get back in the ring. My theory, again, is this could be because, because he wants to become relevant again. If he is going to start an opposition or if he's going to try to run his own company and do something to force the other company out of business or to get his company in business to compete with another company. He needs to be a big card again. 
He needs to be in a position to be over again and to be able to draw money. If he's going to be in a wrestling war with somebody, he's his own best product. So that's my theory. I'm laying it out there. Uh, the third thing that he does, Bob Armstrong says that in all his years in wrestling in Atlanta, that Ray never liked him. Ray never hardly even spoke to him in the dressing room. And he says uh, about the same time frame when Ray starts going back and getting on the card and he's wrestling in the cities and the regular towns, he says he starts coming to me every night and he's going, geez, Bob, I love you, man. You are one of the greatest talents we've ever had here, man. Uh, uh, he, he's complimenting all the time about uh, what a fabulous, fabulous worker he is. And he, and Bob says, I felt uncomfortable. He goes, I couldn't figure out why after all these years that I've been here and he's never done anything to really get close to me. Now he's really become my number one fan. Uh, my theory again was that he's trying to influence Bob. Bob is his top guy. Uh, he wants, if he's going to have a war and if he's going to pull away and if he's going to do what happens here, then he needs Bob as a talent for him. So I understand him hobnobbing with Bob. So on August 1st, 1972, the unthinkable happens. Uh, Ray wrestles against Ox Baker in Savannah, Georgia, and he dies in the dressing room after the match of a heart attack. Uh, changes everything, you think. I mean, uh, you know, this changes everything in, in more ways than one. Uh, I'm not even going to go into all the questions about did Ox Baker kill him with a heart punch? He hit him with a heart punch. Uh, I asked Bob his opinion, uh, and Bob told me, he said, Ron, he said he was so much overweight and he liked to eat, and, uh, and I heard the wrestlers told me that we talked about what happened, and they said he went and had a big, huge dinner about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, which is too late to eat if you're going to wrestle to begin with. And uh, he said he, he's out of shape. And, uh, you know, and maybe Baker hit him uh, a little hard with the heart punch. Uh, it might have had something to do with Baker. It might not have. But it certainly has everything to do with what happens in Atlanta after this point. Well, Ron, with that, I think it's almost perfect timing to end today's show because it kind of ends one chapter in the story of the Georgia Wrestling War, but we're about to start the next chapter, which is really when things start really going crazy, and we'll get to that in a few moments. But as we wrap things up, we want to remind you that you can become a friend of the Tennessee Studs on Facebook. You can like his page, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. You can follow the Tennessee Stud on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last, and you can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com. You can visit the Tennessee Studs website, tnstud.com, for every episode of the Studcast or the Super Studcast and the rest of the story, souvenirs, fan comments, reviews, photos, and so much more, tnstud.com. And on the topic of tnstud.com, we mention the Super Studcast and the rest of the story. Both are always available each month Three bonus hours at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast, only $2.99. And, of course, the latest edition, number nine, Wrestling Riots, is up now. It's been getting great reviews. Check that out, tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Ron, we've begun the story this week. Where are we going next week? Well, obviously, we're we're into the middle of this story, and uh, and. I think fans uh, will just, they're, they're going to just really uh, shake their heads uh, when they hear the end of it. I, we're going to finish it. Uh, we're going to finish this story. Uh, we may be able to finish it in the next stud cast. If, if it takes it, we'll, we'll go to a third stud cast. Uh, it's a, one of the greatest stories of all time in wrestling. And, uh, and it's, it's, it involves my family and I'm going to get in it next, next episode. I'm going to, I have a part in this Atlanta war and, uh, I'll be able to go through that with everyone. We're going to talk about what happens during this war where we actually haven't even quite got to the beginning of the war. So we've got a long way to go here. And, uh, I just hope fans have enjoyed this. I think what we did is laid a lot of foundation here 
for one of the most awesome stories in the history of wrestling. And uh, I'm just uh, pleased to have opportunity to tell, tell my family's side of it. Ron Fuller's Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller, I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.